Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Kenya Fernandez from the University of Sydney and today I'm going to be talking to you about fighting fungal skin infections with Australian Jara honey. So dermatophytes are a group of filamentous fungi and they cause superficial infections of the hair, skin and nails. These infections are collectively described as tinnias and they are the most common fungal infections worldwide. It's been estimated that almost everyone will acquire dermatophytic infection at some point during their lives. And they're also getting a lot more common. Over the last couple of decades, the incidence of tinea of the nails has risen from 2% to 14% in the developed world. And the incidence of athlete's foot has increased to around 20 to 25% of all adults. So there are many factors that have been implicated as being responsible for this. And this includes increased travel, pet ownership, sporting facility use, and an aging population. Currently around 500 million US dollars is spent annually worldwide on antifungal therapies for tinnias. Treatment can be either systemic or topical with the latter being favored due to easier self-administration and less severe side effects. But unfortunately, these therapies often take weeks or even months to resolve the infection. And this is with daily or twice daily applications. Relapse is also sadly very common. So the limitations of current antifungal treatments have led to a renewed interest in natural alternatives, and this includes honey. Honey is a promising candidate for the prolonged topical treatment of superficial infections like tinea due to its broad spectrum antimicrobial properties and its low toxicity. Honey has been used in cosmetics and medicines as an antimicrobial emollient and humectant since ancient times, and is still used extensively in a variety of modern cosmetics. Some recent um, licensing of sterilized honey has also been approved for clinical use. So there are various components of honey which give it antimicrobial properties. Uh, this includes high sugar and a low pH. The most significant antimicrobial activity, however, is generally attributed to either the production of hydrogen peroxide or to non-peroxide derived nectar chemicals. So hydrogen peroxide is a powerful oxidant and it's produced by glucose oxidase, which is a B-derived enzyme that is activated when the honey is diluted with water. Non-peroxide honeys, on the other hand, originate from manuka plants of the Leptospermum genus, and these contain something called methyl glyoxal. So this is a toxic compound that crosslinks and inhibits microbial proteins. However, there are additional non-peroxide floral factors, which can include things like phenolic compounds and peptides that could be from bee or plant origin, as well as other plant factors. So certain unique floral sources from Australia have particularly high levels of antimicrobial activity mediated by hydrogen peroxide, and this could be therapeutically useful for fungal infections. In this study, what we really wanted to do was to characterize the activity of an Australian jarra honey against dermatophyte fungi. So to give you some background, the method for testing the activity of honey that we use uh, is determine something called the minimum inhibitory concentration or MIC. So we use a plate like this full of little wells. Uh, from left to right, we have a decreasing concentration of honey. And from top to bottom, each row has a different fungal microorganism in it. Uh, we then put this in the incubator to let the microbes grow. And then we look to see what the minimum inhibitory concentration is, which means the lowest amount of honey that could inhibit the growth of the microbe. So you can see these here as these highlighted wells that corresponds to the MIC for that particular row. So when we talk about these values, keep in mind that the lower number, the better, because this means that less honey is required for inhibition. Uh, generally, we also test the honey on its own, which gives us the total activity. And then we test the honey after treating it with a catalase solution that abolishes hydrogen peroxide activity. And this gives us the non-peroxide activity. So previous studies have shown that fungi are generally more susceptible to the action of hydrogen peroxide type honeys uh, than to manuka type honeys, and uh, where activity is dependent on methyl glyoxal. Filamentous fungi, including dermatophytes in particular, have also been found to have greater sensitivity to honey um, than yeast species do. So now I'm going to show you some MICs for some dermatophyte and yeast species. And these have been ranked by their susceptibility to hydrogen peroxide. So the ones at the top of the list are the most sensitive, and the ones at the bottom of the list are the least sensitive. Looking at their susceptibility to three hydrogen peroxide-based honeys, we can see that the same pattern holds. The species that are most susceptible to hydrogen peroxide are also most susceptible to the peroxide honeys. And finally, when we treat these honeys with catalase to neutralize the hydrogen peroxide activity, we can see that their activity is totally lost. 
From this, it's clear that hydrogen peroxide is critical for antifungal activity, but is it the only thing responsible? So our next step was to determine the amount of hydrogen peroxide present in our honey samples. And we did this using a standard colorimetric method. So here you can see the result for one of our Jarrah honeys. And we chose this honey in particular to focus on because it had a high level of antifungal activity, but a relatively low level of hydrogen peroxide activity. So when comparing the MIC of hydrogen peroxide alone to the estimated amount of hydrogen peroxide in the honey samples, you can see that there is about eight to 15 times less hydrogen peroxide in the honey. So this tells us that while hydrogen peroxide is critical for antifungal activity, it is not sufficient. So this means that there must be something else in the honey that is making it work so well against fungi. So next we wanted to look at the effect of honey on conidial germination. So we took some fungal conidia and we immediately treated them with either honey or hydrogen peroxide for 48 hours. We then stained the fungal cell wall with something called calcafluor white and then we took a look at them under a fluorescence microscope. So you can see here in the untreated control that the conidia have germinated and produced these long hyphae. However, in all of the hydrogen peroxide or honey treatments, the conidia have been completely prevented from germinating. So this was a really exciting result um, as the resilience of these conidia is a big part of why these diseases are so contagious and why relapse is so common. So that's a great result for honey that it prevents these conidia from germinating. So next, in order to explore how honey actually damages the mature hyphae, uh, we took some conidia and let them grow and mature for 24 hours. And then we treated them with hydrogen peroxide or honey, and we took a look at them under a scanning electron microscope. So treatment with artificial honey and catalase shows that the hyphae are smooth and they have uniform surfaces. Uh, compared to this, however, treatment with JARA at either one or two times the MIC shows uh, prominent bulbs and profusions, with treatment at two times MIC showing the hyphae becoming rough, damaged, and collapse. When catalase was added to neutralize the hydrogen peroxide, the hypal bulging morphology still remained, although some of the roughness and damage was gone. So these hypal deformities suggest that low concentrations of hydrogen peroxide damage the surface of mature hyphae, but that there are other stresses that may be present in Jarahani that cause this ballooning morphology. These results again suggest that hydrogen peroxide production in Jara is necessary, but not sufficient for its high antifungal activity, and that there is another synergizing agent present. Uh, potential synergistic compounds that might be present in Jara include polyphenols, antimicrobial peptides, Maillard reaction products, and glutonic acid. And finally, we looked at whether and how much oxidative stress honey causes. So levels of hydrogen peroxide that exceed the cellular antioxidant defenses can result in either temporary or permanent oxidative changes to cellular structure, including lipids, proteins, and DNA. So to test whether intracellular reactive oxygen species were generated from honey treatment, we used two fluorophores that were sensitive to oxidative species. So cell rocks green and DCFDA. So DCFDA is membrane permeable, and that means that it can be lost from the hypo over time. Cell rocks green, on the other hand, binds irreversibly to the DNA and cannot be lost. So surprisingly, these fluorescence redox dyes were unable to detect internal oxidative stress in mature hypo following treatment with inhibitory or sub-inhibitory concentrations of honey. Unlike treatment with the hydrogen peroxide control, which displayed significant fluorescence, Treatment with honey did not, include, uh, in, sorry, did not increase fluorescence significantly relative to the untreated control. Antifungal agents that damage and kill cells normally do activate stress response pathways. Um, however, stress pathway down regulation has also been observed following synergistic treatments that seem to disrupt the normal stress response. So together, these results suggest that the antifungal mechanism of honey is largely mediated at the hypal surface, um, which is rapidly damaged without invoking intracellular reactive oxygen species. So to summarize our findings, hydrogen peroxide type honey is antifungal, especially against dematophytes. Hydrogen peroxide is critical for activity, but appears to be powered by additional agents. Honey inhibits spore germination and damages hyphal surfaces, but does not generate internal reactive oxygen species. And all in all, honey activity is complex. Our study indicates that Jarrah honey has unique antifungal attributes that may work to inhibit and kill dematophytes, and this makes it a potentially promising candidate for the treatment of tinnias. 
But of course, we still have some questions remaining. Namely, what powers honey activity and can we develop peroxide honey as an effective and marketable antifungal? Continuing this project is something that we're currently working on as part of New South Wales bushfire industry recovery package. Further research aimed at fractionating Jarrah honey samples could help identify these potential synergents and enable a potential rapid screening of honey samples for high activity. And in vitro studies to determine whether the potent antifungal activity of Jarrah honey actually translate to a mycological cure in a clinical setting is needed. So finally, I would just like to acknowledge the two very talented honor students in our lab, Krish Krishnakuma and Annabelle Gutentag, who did the majority of this work. And thank you very much to everybody for listening. And if you'd like to hear more about our project, you can visit the website shown on this slide.